A very common thing we like to do using stoichiometry is start with a given amount or amounts of reactants and calculate the expected amount of typically one, maybe two products that we want out of the reaction. And in order to do this, um, we're going to use the tools of stoichiometry we've already seen and introduce a couple of new ideas in this video. When we don't have exactly the right ratios of reactants corresponding to the balanced chemical equation, for example. So this video is all about reaction yields. How much yield of product should we expect out of a reaction given the reaction's parameters? And how do we really judge the quality of a reaction based on the mass of product we actually do observe versus our theoretical expectation. So we're going to focus on the theoretical expectation first, and then at the end of the video, zero in on percent yield, which is a measure of reaction quality that relates to how much product we actually got relative to our theoretical expectation. So before we begin, I wanted to introduce this concept of the stoichiometric amount. The stoichiometric amount is the exact quantities of reactants that combine according to the balanced chemical equation, and it's often talked about in a relative sense. So if we go back to our pancake recipe as a metaphor or analogy for a balanced chemical equation, there is a stoichiometric amount of each other ingredient corresponding to these amounts of mix. So what's the stoichiometric amount of milk that corresponds to two cups of mix? Well, based on our balanced chemical equation, one cup reacts with 0.75 cups of milk, and so if I've got two cups of milk mix, it's going to take twice as many cups of, of the twice the amount of milk we would say to consume those two cups of mix. So 1.5 cups of milk and two eggs. So the stoichiometric amount of eggs corresponding to two cups of mix is two eggs, and of course this entire mixture would give 16 pancakes. We'll come back to that in a second. We go to three cups mix, well now everything's multiplied by three, so the stoichiometric amounts of milk and eggs are now 2.25 cups and three eggs. And if we go back down to 1.5 cups of mix, we can take our balanced chemical equation and multiply everything by 1.5 to get the stoichiometric amounts of the other ingredients, 1.125 cups of milk and 1.5 eggs. And works equally well on the product side as I alluded to with the first example. So we can make 16 pancakes, that's the stoichiometric amount of product corresponding to the two cups of mix, assuming I have enough of the other ingredients. With three cups of mix and all the other required ingredients, I can make 24 pancakes, that's the stoichiometric amount of pancakes corresponding to three cups of mix. And you probably see where this is going. If I start with 1.5 cups of mix, the stoichiometric amount of product I should expect out is now 12 pancakes. So these stoichiometric amounts are really the exact amounts that combine according to the balanced chemical equation or the balanced recipe, if you will, as we see here. It's not always the case that we have exactly the right amounts of ingredients or reactants, rather, to combine in, in what we call the stoichiometric ratios. Sometimes we have excess of a reactant or multiple reactants. In those cases when we have excess, the limiting reactant is the one that's completely consumed, and it's what really limits reaction progress because, of course, once we run out of the thing that's there in the smallest amount relative to the balanced chemical equation, which is in a point we'll come back to uh, here in a second, once we run out of that limiting reactant, according to conservation of mass, the reaction's done, and any excess of the other reactants will just sit there unreacted. And I wanted to kind of ground this discussion in our pancake analogy before we got into chemical examples, and I'll use another culinary example uh, here shortly as well to talk about limiting reactant. So imagine we had 1.5 cups of milk, 1.1, 1 .1, uh, 1.5 cups of mix, sorry, 1.125 cups of milk, and only one egg. So we've got stoichiometric amounts of mix and milk, but we have less than the stoichiometric amount of egg required to consume these other ingredients. That one egg, if we think about the egg and excess of everything else, excess of the mix and milk, we'll realize that that one egg can make eight pancakes, can be used to make eight pancakes. And that is the amount we will actually be able to make under these circumstances, right? Because we have 
really more milk and mix than we need to consume that one egg. If we go back up to the balanced chemical equation, we see we only need one cup of mix and 0.75 cups of milk. So the egg is really what's limiting the number of pancakes we can make. The extra half cup of mix is just going to sit there unused. The extra, what is this, 0. Uh, 625 cups of milk are going to sit there unused. The egg is the limiting ingredient. We Let's actually stick with the pancake analogy and uh, try to generalize our understanding of limiting reactant a little bit more by talking about limiting ingredient in, in a different context. So say I have 1.5 cups of milk, mix, 1.5 cups of milk, and two eggs which ingredient limits the number of pancakes I can make in this situation given this recipe here. And the recipe is critical because it tells me how much of each ingredient I need to make a certain number of pancakes. One way to generalize our thinking about this is to realize that in identifying the egg as limiting on the last slide, the thing we really realized is that the egg can make the smallest number of pancakes assuming I have enough of everything else. So we can ask this question, how many pancakes can I make with each of those ingredients, forgetting about the other ingredients and just treating that ingredient in isolation, or that ingredient relative to pancakes, and assuming I have enough of everything else, and using the idea that the smallest number of pancakes that I can make corresponds to the limiting ingredient. We're going to apply this idea in a chemical context in a perfectly transferable way here in a couple of slides. But for now, let's talk about pancakes. So with 1.5 cups of mix, I know I can make 12 pancakes. That's just multiplying the eight in the balanced recipe by 1.5, 12 pancakes. 1.5 cups of milk, that's twice as much in the balanced recipe, and so I can make twice as many pancakes, 16. With two eggs, again, that's twice as much as I see in the balanced recipe, one egg in the balanced recipe. So with two eggs, I can again make 16 pancakes. The mix here can make the smallest number of pancakes. This is our smallest pancake yield is associated with the mix is one way to think about this. Therefore, this is the limiting ingredient. Given these amounts of ingredients, we'd only be able to make 12 pancakes in actuality, and we would end up with excess milk and excess egg, half an excess egg, um, in, in making these pancakes. So the mix is the limiting ingredient because it's associated with the smallest pancake yield. I've used this analogy from your text to explain limiting reagent for a number of years and I refer to it as the sandwich analogy. It's really just another culinary application of the idea of limiting ingredient or limiting reagent. And it's a, a simpler recipe than the pancakes, one could argue, because a cheese sandwich just involves two slices of bread and one slice of cheese, and that corresponds to one sandwich. This is a balanced recipe or balanced equation with one sandwich on the product side and two slices of bread and one slice of cheese on the reactant side, if you will. In a limiting reagent problem, that will be given. You'll also be given initial conditions, meaning the amounts of reactants that I am combining in a chemical reaction, or in this case, to make sandwiches. And here on the slide, the example is 28 slices of bread and 11 slices of cheese. These are the initial conditions before the reaction has run its course. One way we can think about solving the limiting reactant or limiting the ingredient problem here is to just start making sandwiches, right? I've got 11 slices of cheese. I'm going to take a slice of cheese, put two pieces of bread around it, boom, there's one sandwich, and keep going until I run out of something. If I do that with the amounts of ingredients that I've got here, I will end up with 11 sandwiches, right? One slice of cheese corresponds to one sandwich, so I can make 11 sandwiches from these 11 slices of cheese and I'll end up with some bread left over because to make those 11 sandwiches I only need 22 slices of bread not 28 and so under these conditions under these initial conditions initial amounts of reactants cheese is the limiting ingredient and bread is what we call in excess and our 11 sandwiches we could say is the theoretical sandwich 
yield, assuming I didn't drop a sandwich on the floor or decide to eat a sandwich while I was making the sandwiches or something like this. Our theoretical sandwich yield, given the initial conditions, is 11. One other thing I'll point out here is that if you think about the bread in isolation, forgetting about how much cheese you've got, you'll realize that with the 28 slices of bread, you could hypothetically make 14 sandwiches, but the smaller number of sandwiches is associated with the limiting ingredient. And in a chemical context, the smaller amount of product produced, or as we'll generalize it, the smaller the number of reactant, reaction events associated with that reactant, um, the smallest number of reaction events or the smallest amount of product is associated with the limiting reactant. Now in the pancake and sandwich examples, things are relatively simple because one product is produced. It's a sandwich or it's a set of pancakes. In a chemical reaction, multiple products in different ratios is much more common as we've already seen. And so it can get a little unwieldy and confusing to think about, okay, which product am I using? And I gotta figure out, okay, everything with respect to that product. That's one way to approach limiting reactant problems. I don't like that approach uh, because you, you're living in a specific context when you don't need to be. And you don't need to be if you understand the concept of a reaction event, which we're going to introduce here. This idea that every time a reaction occurs, we can say a, a reaction event has taken place and we can count those to figure out limiting reagent without ever worrying about how much product is produced, unless we need to figure that out, which we can again do from our count of reaction events. So we're going to define it here, and then we'll see how it can be applied to solve limiting reactant problems over the next few slides. A reaction event is simply a single occurrence of a reaction. It's just a reaction taking, a pl taking place one time at the molecular level, one combination of reactants to form one set of product molecules. And the number of reaction events that occurs in a particular context, we're going to represent using the variable x. And you'll see this in other contexts, actually, in your introductory chemistry courses, most famously in chemical equilibrium and ice tables. And I'm actually going to link out to a video on ice tables for those of you watching on YouTube um, to point to this idea that reaction events are used in that context using the letter x as well. They also show up in thermodynamics in the per mole units of energy per mole refers to reaction events. And you can really imagine one reaction event sitting above every arrow in every balanced chemical equation. It's really a hidden stoichiometric coefficient. One occurrence of the reaction happens every time all these reactant molecules form all these product molecules, right? And it, it, it takes a very unwieldy looking reaction like this with, with crazy stoichiometric coefficients and really, really reduces it down, particularly the product side, to something fairly simple. One reaction event has occurred. The other thing it allows us to do is think of each stoichiometric coefficient as a ratio with respect to moles of reaction events. So the coefficient on a reactant or product A can be read as the moles of A consumed or produced for every mole of reaction events. That's one way can, we can read the stoichiometric coefficient off a balanced chemical equation. And these are really a unifying concept in stoichiometry, and I hope to demonstrate that to you by showing how these can be used in limiting reactant problems.